thanks everybody for coming. I'm Karanjit Singh from Kelton Tech, and uh, I'll be talking to you about uh, digital transformation uh, using IoT and Drupal. So let's just dive right away. So what exactly is digital transformation? I'm going to start off with a little bit about the digital transformation, the IoT, and then kind of build it out to what we, the work that we have done there. So what exactly is digital transformation? Of course, there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of talk of digital. You know, you had Dries, you had Janet, everybody talking about digital. Uh, you know, essentially, it's about applying all these new technologies, the digital technologies, to create personalized experiences for your users and kind of uh, trying to reach all your customers. So it's essentially about personalizing the experience. Uh, you know, if we were to just break it down into the point technologies that are being uh, used in here, so obviously we have had the social media. So all of these have existed uh, for you know, some time now and been used uh, individually as point solutions or sometimes in combination. Uh, you know, so basically the social media essentially about customer engagement, you know, building brand value. Then it's about mobility. So you know everybody has to have a mobile app nowadays. Uh, you know, but then again, mobility you have a lot of things that have come around with it, like location-based services. Uh, you know, essentially putting your uh, going from the desktop to essentially having a mobile storefront, personalizing things uh, for your users. Then again, uh, you know the whole analytics and big data and analytics that can go around with it. So you can kind of uh, essentially. Uh, do a lot of, derive a lot of insights into your, you know, customers, uh, you know, do everything from, you know, predictive, prescriptive analytics. Most of these things nowadays, you know, this is a game changer, and everybody talks about cloud, but one big thing that it does is it kind of socializes or kind of democratizes uh, the use of computing power for people, you know, for startups, who just with a credit card today can kind of get a computing power which is available to any large enterprise today and then put together all the solutions and essentially uh, create experiences, unique experiences for their customers. Now these things, these four have essentially been out there uh, for a while, mostly being used as point, uh, you know, in, in, in point ways. And the latest uh, that's being talked about is IoT, you know, something which is uh, still a little way out but already interesting things that are happening around there. Uh, which will essentially kind of, uh, you know, we'll have all sorts of sensors out there talking to each other and with people. And uh, what essentially the digital transformation piece kind of does today, or this something happened, uh, let's say the inflection point was last year, when it's not really about that one point solution like just mobility or just, uh, you know, analytics, but about a combination of these whole things, you know, the whole thing coming together and basically, you know, providing a complete, uh, seamless experience, which is what essentially is the digital transformation, and uh, we'll get into a little bit detail into what we're doing there. And in a sense, uh, you know, people are calling whatever is happening now in the whole digital space, which is the whole social, mobile, analytics, cloud, and the IoT, as pretty much the fourth, uh, you know, revolution. So of course, the first one, every industrial revolution causes a lot of social changes a lot of uh, you know, changes on the ground in terms of the way we live and work. So the first one, of course, was the water and steam, power. Then we had electricity. In a sense, the IT system or computers in 1960s, 70s, you know, is where it all started. It kind of looks the same. You know, everybody says, hey, you know, it's the same thing. But what is changing this time around is basically the way uh, everything is coming together and you are able to address and talk to a customer in a very unique, uh, in a unique uh, personalized conversation that you can have with your customers. So essentially, previously it was about you know simple digitization. I am basically that was the third industrial revolution. I was automating th things. Most of the things that were happening, if you went to any enterprise or any business, was something which was behind or behind its firewall, behind its premise. Okay, but uh, you know. What is going to happen now is basically a combination of these technologies, the innovation that can happen by combining this technology is basically uh, you know, forcing companies to re-examine the way do, they do business because they're able to uniquely, uh, in a very individualistic uh, way, personalized way, able to talk to their customers one-on-one. -on -one. So, you know, 
just the internet of things this is just the uh, slide which, you know which talks about iot so iot is basically you know linking the physical and digital worlds essentially any part you know of our environment our natural systems human systems physical objects they are soon they are already and soon they're going to connect and start interacting uh, with things you know just some graphics around things so essentially you know re your refrigerator will start asking you to get milk when the way back home and uh, you know if if you sort of forget then it will kind of replace your spouse for you and kind of complain to you <laughs> it's going to be you know who controls whom so you know you could have things like these you know you could have hey you know we just got to go out because my refrigerator and my stove have stopped speaking to each other <laughs> or you could have cases like uh, where the machines will take over and uh, you know basically threaten to cut off access to your refrigerator just because you're overweight and of course you know the worst of it all you could just get unfollowed by your uh, your coffee machine <laughs> so these can have very pers <laughs> personal impacts on you but that's just the lighter side of things essentially the future of iot you know essentially sky is the limit these are the numbers that we're talking about we already have about 10 billion connected devices but increasingly what's going to happen in the future is till now we have not really concerned ourselves so much about uh, hey is a thing talking to me is a you know a sensor or a machine talking to me but in the future about pretty much 99% of everything will be interconnected and talk to each other that's going to be the natural design principle so everything from your street lights to your heart monitors to your dog collars everything pretty much will become enabled uh, with these kind of uh, you know uh, enabled and talk to each other let's say this is just the potential i mean just just the raw numbers you're talking about you know you'll have 4 4 billion connected people you know a 4 trillion revenue opportunity millions of apps and of course billions of embedded and integrated systems of course all of them are going to produce huge amount of data so you know this is the huge potential that we're talking about now as a company kelton tech uh, you know we have uh, been working in the whole uh, newer technologies that we talked about the whole smack space uh, for a few years now and one of us kind of uh, areas of interest always has been uh, you know location based uh, services uh, especially in the mobility space and one of the interesting things that happening there was basically the whole indoor proximity technology so essentially the beacons which essentially enable devices to you know perform defined actions when you get into close proximity uh, so one of the things is today if you go at uh, you know you look at lbs uh, you know essentially what you have is a lat long but when you are in a building like this you really do not know whether you are on which floor you are so essentially the whole proximity based uh, technology we kind of kelton tech has married its ex expertise in iot and uh, lbs to essentially create you know uh, digital experiences in the indoor navigation space that's kind of essentially what we have done so you know what does indoor proximity technology enable so these are some of the use cases that you can uh, you know obviously envision some of them are already happening we have been part of some solutions that are already out there so things like omni channel uh, shopping experience you know you're in a you're in a mall on which floor are you close to a particular shop you can get some things you have location based promotions you could have product display information you could know what are the heat maps where are your customers are you could gamify their uh, their behaviors after you get some insights you know continuing on you could have things like navigation assistance you know at at large spaces like these or at airports you could also do queue busting you know a session is running full you could actually gamify the behavior and say something interesting is happening somewhere else or something is running empty you could gamify things by giving out a little deal or information or uh, pushing a notification you could do crowd crowd flow management of course you can do a whole lot of monitoring at the back end as you are collecting a lot of this information and obviously uh, you know the, there's the whole security angle to it so you know essentially what's happening is you know this is a period of great change in terms of the whole digital transformation space and essentially a whole lot of business models are getting uh, disrupted changed a lot of startups by using the whole smack thing are disrupting large businesses and of course it's going to change and have very uh, deep and meaningful changes into the way we kind of live and work 
so some of our customers are basically using this whole indoor proximity technology uh, that are helping them to you know define actions using eye beacons and uh, you know some of the reasons why people choose eye beacons over say gps or rfid of course you know i already talked about gps you know gps just gives you a lat long location you really still do not know where exactly you are vertically so you have accuracy obviously these devices are low energy uh, only they work on proximity so you can set the proximity it's 5 meters it's it's 20 meters whatever it is so there's a whole lot of privacy it's not like they're they're beaming your information all over the place obviously there's the integration and usability so what uh, we have as Skelton Tech is basically uh, we work with a lot of customers and built a generic uh, sort of platform which we call the Kelter Tech uh, location-based gamification analytics and uh, rich messaging engine. Uh, that's kind of what we have built. Essentially, it's a framework or accelerator that we have developed uh, that helps basically, uh, you know, has features like rich, uh, rich push notification, uh, can provide you navigation assistance. Let's say you're in an airport, it can pretty much take you to your gate. It can do real-time analytics. You arrived for your flight, uh, you know, just half an hour, it can pretty much give you navigation assistance and give you uh, notification to say, hey, rush to your gate. And you arrived three hours early and it can pretty much give you deals and gamify the behavior to get you to your, uh, to your favorite restaurant, your favorite shopping spot in, in, the, uh, you know, in the airport. Obviously, uh, you know, this is, uh, since we, it's a framework or accelerator, uh, and the use cases are that I could take it to a lot of, and I'll talk about the use cases. We needed capability at the back end where I could quickly configure, uh, you know, the locations, what sort of messages need to go out, what sort of behaviors need to happen. So we have a, basically a CMS uh, enabled back end. Essentially, it has to be scalable, uh, customizable, and it is IoT ready because we basically use the whole uh, proximity and interior navigation. Uh, you know, kind of couple of use cases. Uh, you know, uh, I already talked about. Uh, uh, you know, using it uh, in travel and hospitality. You can use it in retail and e-commerce. So essentially, you know, at your malls, you can use it at entertainment centers. You can use it at events and amusement parks. Uh, so you can help to modernize all these things. Like to just to give you a little example, uh, one of the things that we've actually gone and done some uh, uh, work with are museums. So but today, if you go to a museum, it's pretty much a paper-based system you, you, or you have fixed tours. Now, once you have beacons there as IoT devices, which, are, uh, which tell you where, what the exact location is, uh, using our platform, you can pretty much configure, let's say you're, you're at a museum, you pretty much know that I have only got about an hour to see whatever I want to see. You can pretty much uh, go to the application, tell it that I'm only interested in two exhibits. It can create a dynamic uh, navigation for you, help you with uh, you know, the timings, it can also do some uh, little deals and stuff for you. So that's the kind of application. You go near an exhibit uh, pretty much uh, as you approach it because it's, an, uh, you know, it's a proximity technology. I can set the proximity when you're near this painting by like say, only about two meters from there, pretty much on your mobile, it'll pop up all the information about that particular exhibit uh, for you. So those are the kind of use cases that uh, you know, we've worked on. Uh, this is essentially kind of the architecture. So if you see on the right side, uh, as I said, you know, we have a CMS as a backend. Obviously, that's Drupal today. So that's Drupal. Of course, uh, you know, we have the, you know, the gaming, the, the gamification engine, uh, the analytics engine, of course, a lo location engine and a messaging engine. Of course, all of this is exposed. It's, it's headless. So it's all exposed via web services. Uh, which are working with a mobile device. So that's the device that a customer is actually using. Let's say you're in a museum or you're in an airport or you're in a shopping mall. That's the device that you're using. And that's the one that interacts now with the IoT devices, which, can, which are iBeacons today. But our platform can support, you know, uh, all sorts of uh, newer technologies that will come up there. So this is something that we have actually done for a customer, uh, you know, called Venue, Venue IQ. So essentially, they wanted to do the same thing, but a specific use case was about you know, a conference like this. They want to do attendee check-ins. They want to provide navigation assistance. You can do networking, so you know who, who's attending. You can network with them, locate them. You can actually send out promotions and advertisements, so you can kind of gamify some of that. 
And you can do a lot of other gamification. Some sessions are running full. You can pretty much inform people about, hey, there's another interesting session happening or the other way, other way around. Uh, you can have, uh, so this was the client requirements. And essentially their use case itself, we have something, uh, we built it as a platform. So essentially they can actually use this for you know the kind of uh, applications that we've talked about there, which is conferences and exhibitions, museums and galleries, parks, retail stores, hotels, restaurants. So that's the kind of use case they are building out. So there are a couple of them that are already working on or have done POCs. Now coming back to the question of, hey, you know, so we are providing a digital experience using IoT, but why Drupal? Of course, apart from the fact that we love Drupal, uh, Drupal has some advantages. So of course, if you see, you know, uh, the evolution of Drupal, Drupal was uh, basically built uh, to essentially, you know, build uh, websites. But then slowly, uh, you know, integrations were built into it, and uh, Drupal can interact very well with third-party applications. Thereafter, then there was the whole thing about Drupal be became responsive, and essentially, uh, you, you know, it's today ready, mobile ready. And then, uh, you know, now the, uh, the you know the next approach that has opened up is essentially, which is what we are actually using, which is Drupal as a service platform using headless Drupal. That's kind of what we are doing. So if you go back to the to the slide that I had here, essentially we're using headless Drupal, exposing things by web services, and then having the mobile device, which are actually talking to our IoT devices, which are iBeacons in this case. Uh, pretty much, that's the whole solution that we put together. And of course, uh, you know, the, all the strengths that come with having a CMS, we are able to easily configure it, uh, you know, for for different conferences. In fact, we uh, this application uh, was at Tycon last week, so we were doing the complete. Uh, the whole KL game platform was deployed there. Uh, it was the, uh, the mobile, I mean, people know it as the mobile application for the conference, but it was pretty much doing everything that we talked about. Uh, we were actually at the uh, NASCOM leadership forum, uh, which is NASCOM is the industry body for Indian software uh, industry. We pretty much uh, did it there. And we were at the IIT global leadership uh, conference as well, where uh, you know, it was deployed pretty successfully and uh, we got some great feedback. So coming to my, uh, you know, towards the end, essentially, why were we using Drupal for IoT? So essentially, it's a strong CMS, allows us all the flexibility that we need in terms of configuring. Uh, it's a stable and mature system, it's scalable, and of course, has a very active community. The other thing is, of course, uh, it, it provides seamless integration. We are able to easily uh, integrate and collect data from multiple IoT devices. We are able to expose data, you know, has, has flexible APIs. Uh, we were able to easily integrate with third-party tools. And the other thing that we have not, you know, uh, it's getting there is as we uh, kind of put this kind of uh, platforms out there, essentially starts getting used in, say, you know, in malls or starts uh, getting used by enterprises at their stores. Obviously, you're going to have a huge amount of data that is going to get collected. So we can integrate this very easily with MongoDB uh, at a later date or you know, technologies like that, uh, which will allow us to handle the big data and uh, the complex data challenges that will ar uh, arise with it. And of course, it, uh, you know, uh, apart from the, all the other functionalities that we have written there. So that's kind of our rationale for using Drupal as the backend system for uh, for uh, the KL game platform. So, yeah, my session was half an hour, so I had to really rush through since we were a little late. But thank you. That's. <laughs> so, if you have any questions, I can answer them. Mahesh, uh, Mahesh is my colleague, so if we can both address any questions. This time, I have a question: Is this your current platform is on Drupal seven or eight? Right now, it's on Drupal seven. Is, uh, is there any reason why you didn't use it since it is already uh, out? That's because uh, we were working on this for almost the last one and a half, two years now. So Drupal 7 was the only one at that time. But yeah, we'll migrate it to Drupal 8 very soon. Yeah, but we, we've been building this for almost uh, close to one and a half, two years now. What uh, protocols are these IoT devices using to communicate with Drupal? 
what protocols are the IoT devices using? Uh, well, I do not have that information handy, uh, but like, you know, uh, they come with some authoring tools uh, uh, along with the, the sensors and things, and then uh, those are used to integrate with the mobile. And the mobile application is the one that actually talks to Drupal. So REST APIs, yes. So because it's uh, not just about mobile, uh, like, you know, we've also done an integration with Google Glass uh, on the front end, but like, you know, yeah, Google decided to shelf the project for some time, and uh, like, you know, yeah, in future, whatever kind of new variables come up, like, you know, since it's an headless, it can seamlessly integrate. Were you like familiar with Drupal before using it for IoT stuff? Because uh, uh, I want to know if, uh, if there's any other uh, things that you could recommend or that you would recommend Drupal instead for the IoT. Yeah. So we have been working in Drupal for more than close to 10 years now. Uh, we started using Drupal, Drupal 4.3 or 4.7. So those were the kind of versions. So that's that's how uh, old uh, we so were engaged kind of with Drupal. For you, I guess. Yeah, so, so Drupal is one of the, our core expertise areas, but uh, other than it, we do work in a uh, very large spectrum of things, like uh, web, uh, social, mobile analytics, cloud, and internet of things. So all, all the spectrum of digital technologies that Karanjit showed, we work across all of those. Uh, again, in, um, uh, on the web itself, like you know, apart from Drupal, we work with WordPress, lot many flavors of PHP, Java, .NET, anything. But Drupal was a kind of a natural choice because like, you know, uh, most of the times when you're building a platform, what happens is you need to deploy the platform and uh, create the solution for the client very quickly. So Drupal gives some nice out of the box flexibility, uh, like user management, permissions or roles and handling of the content, etc. So Drupal was a kind of a natural choice. I have uh, two different questions. Um, do you have an uh, API call uh, management? And that's the, uh, the first question. And, um, Can you just be, be a little louder? Yeah, do, uh, do, <laughs> do you have an uh, API call uh, management, like, for example, uh, FG or any other like, you know, third party uh, you know, FG management uh, <coughs> interface? And, uh, do, and second one is, uh, is there any like you know use case uh, in terms of uh, uh, healthcare industry using uh, IoT? Yeah. So I'd like to take the first question. Uh, second question, I'll leave it to Karanjit because uh, we have done one of the largest M governance uh, rollouts uh, uh, in India in healthcare sector. So Karanjit can give some nice examples of how IoT can benefit. Uh, the first question in terms of the API management, we currently are not using any third party tool or anything. We have uh, basically using what Drupal provides and extended the APIs a bit to make it more uh, friendly uh, for the mobile devices and faster responses. Uh, but eventually, yeah, we may explore in future, like, you know, if any third, third party or a specific API management uh, is required. Yeah, Karanjit, do you want to take the right? Yeah, <clears throat> so actually, yeah, healthcare is another, so yeah, I, I listed all that, and one of the things that we've been thinking for a while now is essentially healthcare, because again, uh, the whole uh, indoor proximity location is an interesting use case. Uh, just as Mahesh mentioned, we've actually done uh, one of the largest uh, mobile-based, uh, uh, you know, public health e-governance initiatives in India, about, uh, you know, about 10 million people already on the platform. And one of the things that we are talking to the public health officials in India is about, uh, you know, today they do a lot of uh, things in terms of measurement of your, you know, blood pressure and things like that. So those are interesting use cases. We talk, and there are there is interesting work happening in that space. Uh, there are uh, startups uh, which are building uh, uh, sort of IoT, uh, you know, maybe the more advanced Fitbits, which are more specialized. So we are working with them, and uh, that's something which is an interest area. Uh, 
that's something that we can easily plug into the platform because essentially it's standard based. Uh, the whole backend is all there. All we have to do is essentially enable uh, it, uh, you know, just enable it and connect it to the platform. So, yeah. questions all right thanks for your time and uh, we are at uh, booth uh, 624 if any of you have any follow-up questions or anything that comes to your mind uh, we are at 624 so glad to discuss with uh, with you anytime thank you overhead. First off, let me take this jacket off. I'm crazy enough to run around here in a jacket in this awesome, yeah, I know, people shaking their heads. <laughs> this awesome heat. Right. Let's see if I can get this up here. looking pretty good. If it's okay with everybody, I'll keep it in this mode because I have some tabs on the top and I want to jump over to. It's going to be a lot easier than hitting the, uh, the escape key. Um, so it'll be a little, at least a little bit more simplistic, as it were. So I'm here to talk to you guys today about Drupal as a platform for the U.S. government. Um, my name, about me, I'm Dave Galaruzzo, the uh, CEO of Fig Leaf Software. These are just some shameless picks from times I got to spend overseas some years ago. But I'm the uh, CEO of Fig Leaf Software, classically educated in uh, computer science, math, and economics. Um, I'm an old style desktop developer. I moved to the web like everybody else did back in the 90s. Um, I got my start in Cold Fusion. I actually still work it, believe it or not. Very, very old, 20 some years you know, ago. I started playing with it on diskettes, and, and now I'm doing Drupal. Um, added it on as part of our business back in 2010, primarily because of the government. Government started to look at open source about five, six years ago, really seriously. Um, and at that point, we were working for clients on platforms that they were purchasing for lots and lots of money, right? The government said, well, let's look at this open source thing. And what was kind of interesting was luckily, luckily for everybody, they got confused between open source and open data. And so they started doing open source platforms when open data was really the initiative. But that's okay. We'll do both, right? It's no big deal. Um, I'm someone that stays close to the code and the infrastructure just because I put a coat on and a nice little fig leaf shirt. Um, this whole computer science thing right here, I did that because I love it. So I actually teach our module dev course at fig leaf and you know, I stay real close to what we do on the Drupal platform, probably a little more than I should and to the detriment of my employees. They really hate the fact that I stick my nose in probably a little bit too much. Will here works for me, he'll tell you that. So, um, so why am I here, right? What am I here to talk to you guys about today? Um, I'm here to talk to you guys about Drupal as a platform at the Department of the Interior. It's really a business case study for what we're doing out at DOI right now and uh, the work that we're doing for these guys. And it's really digital transformation in the public arena. It's the whole idea behind why we're chatting today. Um, Department of the Interior, as you may or may not know, is one of the largest government agencies out there. It's very, very big. They have a, a very large number of bureaus that are under them. One of our marquee clients is the National Park Service, which is a bureau within DOI. Um, and we've been working that environment since 2004. Uh, Park Service is a gigantic animal, billion page views a year, lots and lots of traffic, 99.999% uptime, et cetera, et cetera. But the Department of the Interior themselves, because of all the bureaus that they have, that we've managed and built DOI.gov back in 2009, um, they actually had what? We called it in the beginning, right? What there was at the Department of the Interior was a lot of chaos, right? And what do we mean by chaos? And frankly, there still is a lot of chaos there. But it's much less than this 
gigantic black screen with the red writing and everything that I've got up here um, today. It, the Interior Bureaus in 2009 had a lot of different things. Um, this is Bureau of Reclam Reclamation, Fish and Wildlife Service, Parks, um, OSM, USGS, the Geological Survey. They're still kind of out there on their own. Department of the Interior, all of these guys, Bureau of uh, BIA, Bureau of, Indian, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Bureau of Land Management, etc. These guys are on day software, which is, you know, uh, CQ, what Adobe calls CQ. They now call Adobe Experience Manager, and what I call a gigantic thing to implement, right? It's a big, big, big lift. I don't know why the government would spend half a million dollars buying a, a software package just to manage your content, right? Not saying BLM did, but they paid a lot of money for it. And then Minerals Management Service, which is now called BESI, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, they're on Ektron. Now, luckily for us as a contract, you know, a contractor, Comspot and Ektron are things that we work, right? We've got a .NET business and a full fusion business. And we're still running parks on Comspot. DOI was on this Comspot platform. And the problem is there's a lot of stuff here, all right? Not only is there a lot of stuff, they had to stand up and keep the Denver Data Center going just for these guys to have a place to host. It's a lot of money to keep a data center going, all right? Tons of money. Not only that, they were in, they were responsible for everything. Parks is still running in that data center right now. It's going to move to AWS eventually um, if the contractor that they're using can figure out how to just get everything up into the cloud, right? Hey, us. But that whole Denver data center thing was a gigantic, and has been a gigantic, cost suck for the government, right? Lots and lots of money to put stuff out in that data center. Lots and lots of people to support it. So what they, you know, what they decided to do was they decided that they wanted to move forward. They wanted to go from this, which is what the website looked like in 2009, about a year, right after the inauguration of President Obama here. You can see the, uh, the screen. What they did is they went from that to this, which we built for them in 2009 in six weeks, um, unfortunately, because the big boss wanted to win for the first uh, the first State of the Union had to have a brand new website up there for the Department of the Interior. So we had six weeks, a really crappy Christmas, and I spent all night on my birthday pushing this thing into the Denver Data Center while my wife had a great, nice, homemade coconut cream pie waiting for me at the house, right? Didn't get to eat that for another day. But we went from this to where they are today, which is this. This is their new site in I'm actually going to kick over to it. It's in Drupal. It's fully responsive. It is re it's, it's really a very, very nice launch for these guys. All right? It's too bad we didn't do this in 2009. And we didn't build this in six weeks. We'll talk about that. All right? It took a little bit longer to, to launch the new DOI.gov website. But what did we do? And how did we actually make all of this work? What did we do to, to sort of bring it all together? So... DRI moved forward with this idea, and this was the, and this is something we actually had influence. The first pictures I showed you, I'm an old jarhead, right? 25 years in the Marine Corps, so I'm a firm believer, and I'm not saying that other people aren't, but for me, the government dollar and how it's spent, it's a big, big deal. Okay? We supported DOI.gov with one developer for six years. One guy, the main DOI.gov website. He was a full-time dude. He's the guy that actually moved from Cold Fusion to Common Spot over to Drupal, and he now supports DOI.gov on the Drupal platform, which is actually a pretty cool story, right? But for a very long time, we supported them with one person. Why? Because it was economical for the government. A lot of other large integrators, they have a whole team, right? Seven people, et cetera. DOI, when they decided they were going to do a platform, one thing that we talked to them about, this is a what I call a lesson learned, is we said, look, decouple your platform choice and your vendor that brings your platform in and implements it for you from the people that are going to build your ultimate site, okay? Because if you don't, what's going to happen is you're going to get locked in. You're going to be locked into the people that do your platform, and then they're going to be locked into doing the sites. And at the end of the day, there's going to be no economy of scale for the government, and there's going to be no way for you to do anything other than say, how much money is this going to cost? And then they're going to tell you it's going to cost X. And X is all the money that you're going to have to spend, okay? So we said, take that platform and separate it. Do a procurement just to figure that out. Focus on your platform. And then after that, you can issue procurement 
to build out your websites, all right? To do the sites for the bureaus. But start with a platform. So DOI decided to move forward. Now they thought about a lot of different things. They looked at Adobe, I don't know why, they did, right? Because that's a big spend. For Adobe, they just spent millions of dollars on the software alone, just to get it actually out there. And they really don't need what comes in that package, okay? For them, the ability to track what people are doing is not nearly as important as just having a nice experience for the taxpayer to actually come in and get data from the Department of the Interior. Now, for our friends at Park Service, maybe a little different because Parks does make money off of us. Even though we pay taxes, people come to Parks and they pay money to get in and it goes into the budget, right? But that's okay. They, they provide a great service to the American people and to the people that come from other countries to, to visit and go to our parks. So DOI decided to actually put a platform together and they made some choices. They put a procurement out and in the procurement what they decided was that every one of these agencies, when they wanted to, all right, DOI can't force them. And if you work with the governments that, or government agencies that have soft heroes, you'll figure that out. Like to most of these guys, especially these guys, right, and these guys, and oh by the way, these guys, right, to them, they aren't even part of Interior. It's, you know, hey, we just kind of exist and Interior is on top of us. But they're not the boss of me, right? That's the, that's the thing. However, when, when they started looking at a platform, if they said we're going to push something like Adobe, forget it, right? All these guys over here were like, you know, excuse my language, fight me, right? I'm not going to play that game. But when they said, hey, let's talk about Drupal, then everybody just, you know, stood up and took notice, right? It was only a few years ago the platform was put together. It's Drupal, it's government, right? You have all these agencies doing it, it's been proven, et cetera, et cetera. So what they did was they put a procurement out and they, they just bought platform and they just bought what their hosting is. So they put Drupal platform as a service together. It's running on IBM software, so IBM is their vendor that <laughs> manages the actual platform. Phase two went in with IBM and took the open public distribution and they made it into something called Open DOI, so they customized it. Right? So we now have a distribution running within that environment and that built off open public, proven distribution, et cetera, et cetera, that we can use, right? Customize. Right? So they have this environment running. IBM manages that environment much like you know Aquia does their environment or Black Mesh or anybody else we host with, but it's dedicated to the Department of the Interior. Right? So they stood it up and dedicated it, FedRAMP compliant, all the good stuff that you want actually have, all those buzzwords that we need to have, it's all buzzword compliant, right, which is a big thing. You gotta have that, gotta have buzzwords. Phase two spent the time working with IBM to get everything stood up, went through a series of workshops with, with the Department of the Interior to put some levels of functionality into the platform. And lucky for us, we partner with them very, very closely um, to work on the site build outs, right? So when we went down into the site build out, we became best friends with them, said, hey, let's work together, and it's been really wildly fantastic. One of the lucky times when you actually work with other companies and seamlessly work together, right? So first they built this platform. Now, the, uh, the, the way that they did it was very agile, all right? Um, it's cloud hosting, which is out of DOI's hands. It's extremely agile. So DOI's like, I'm done. I'm not worried about this. I don't have to worry about the, the disk array going down like they did in Denver at least once a month because it was an old array. And, Somebody need to move into a new array. And you wouldn't believe the chicanery that would go on. It's, you know, if I could package the email and actually sort of uh, share it, 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 was, it was always very funny. Uh, Drupal is open source, right, which is a big deal for the Fed community. People love it. Um, it works, and it's, it's got a good reputation. We know that. The SLA for uptime was only 99.9% where they get the month for free. And that was a big deal for the government clients specifically was the ability to say, if I'm not up to my SLA, I don't pay for the month for hosting, right? So that's, you know, that's also a way to make it a lot cheaper for them. And then easy creation of Fed websites for Drupal. I'm a little disingenuous. I don't know that it's all easy, but it's efficient. How about that, right? We have a place to go, a place to stand up, um, new sites when we want to, right, and when we can. The cost. You don't usually see this in, in talks, but I'll throw it out there for you. Um, for the feds, they were able to, their past setup was a quarter of a million bucks, right there. Um, their DOI.gov migration 
Uh, that was about three hundred and thirty thousand dollars, right? <coughs> with content, with content. I'm going to talk about content in a little bit. Um, the Vesky migration is two hundred and ten grand. However, Vesky has a big content issue that we're dealing with as a separate, um, is as a separate contract. I'll talk to you guys about content in a minute. Because frankly, of all the things we talk about here today, that's probably the most important. And then Bureau of Land Management, so DOI and BSEE and BLM and DOI OIG are, you know, all in the mix, right? Either in dev or they're live. They're only paying about $11,000 a month, okay, for these four sites. And then when they had a fifth and a sixth and a seventh, they're still paying $11,000 a month. And they add an eighth site, they're still paying eleven grand a month. Think about that for a minute, all right? That's not a whole heck of a lot of money for the Department of the Interior to host pretty much every bureau except Park Service, right? If Parks wanted to go on the platform and move over to, to Drupal, um, then they would have to see an increase because they just take too much traffic, right? And Parks is spending god awful amount of money on Akamai anyway just to front their, their um, service. DOI's actually got Akamai in front, they don't take the traffic, but it, it's really there for an integration point for that. And by the way, we've actually integrated Akamai into the platform. So for every one of these sites, anytime you make a content change, call the Akamai API directly, right, as part of the push, and it invalidates the content so it makes its way through Akamai as quickly as it's going to make its way to Akamai, right? Akamai's all over the place. It's not so easy to invalidate cash. That's another great thing in the feds, you know, when they're working with the CDN, every time we've worked with Limelight, Level 3, Akamai, CloudFront, they expect your validation to be automatic. I'm like, there's this whole point of presence thing around the planet where it's got to propagate. It's not going to be automatic. You've got to wait a few minutes, right? At least a few minutes. If you want real-time content, then we'll pass it away. So, and then the developer support, we have a full-time dev. He's really only supporting DOI.gov. Um, I should have put that. DOI OIG is the Office of the Inspector General for the Department of the Interior. They have their own separate website. They didn't used to, but they do now. Lots of infighting over there, so I say, hey, go out on your own. So we have a developer that's actually dedicated to just being there to, to, to support these guys. Same guys supported the old site. So they invested about a million and a half so far, right, to go through this. Now we'll talk about that ROI a little bit later on because we can actually take all of this. And site builds, you know, you're going to pay that regardless. If you're migrating, you're going to pay that money. But it's really the past setup and then the build it's really the hosting where they've taken a gigantic return on investment. The build out stuff, we put it in there to say, hey, this is how much it'll cost you. If you're working with an agency and you want to do something similar, these costs are in line, right? So the way they set this up, which was really good, is they set up what's called a blanket purchase agreement with five companies. Five, uh, about 40 companies competed to get on the BPA. This is a separate contract from the platform contract, right? We're not crossing the streams, right? There's a new uh, Ghostbusters movie coming out. We're not crossing the streams, right? I know I'm dating myself on this one. You should have seen my original picture of, uh, of why are we here. It was Admiral Stockdale. I'm like, nobody's going to know who that is. So. Acquia certified Drupal list. This is the biggest rub for the companies that competed on it. Why do they have to be Acquia certified, et cetera, et cetera, right? We can talk about that all day. My people have gone through the certification. Why? Because for the Department of the Interior is the only measure they have. Right? Yes, I know you guys have worked with great companies and you have, you've built 50 sites and you've done everything under the sun and you've got things that are really fast and tens of clients and everything, and that's all fantastic. But when the government's procuring, there's no, they can't tell, okay? The only thing they can do is take a measure. And they said the measure for us is offering certification. That's it, done. And what I told my guys when they all bitch and moan, excuse my language, about having to go through certification, I said, you're all going to pass it. And they all did. They just didn't want to take the test, right? So at the end of the day, that was, that was a requirement to be on the BPA. And it shut down a lot of uh, organizations that were out there. And there was a lot of heaven and harm. But it is what it is. That was not something that I suggested, by the way. They picked it up on their own. Everybody had to have government experience. We have a lot. Not only we work with DOI, we work with X-24 Bank, BG, Voice of America. Of course, we work with parks. Large scale projects, right? You have to at least have some experience playing around in the field. I'll talk a little bit about some of the particulars for each of these sites in a minute. And then we just compete with each other for the business. Some compete better than others. Um, that's a separate issue. But 
Uh, everybody goes in, puts task orders in to do the studies, right? So that way the government gets their best cost. And what they do is they'll come to us and say, we want to move the Bureau of Land Management. How much money do you think that would be? And then we'll tell them what we think, and they go to all the other people, all the other BPA holders, and they tell them what they're going to think. And then they'll fund enough money to cover the site, right? So they know they can get their site, and it's predictable. That's a big return on investment for the government because a lot of times you know, they'll go in, it'll be a TM, and all this extra money gets added on, et cetera, et cetera. They just do them as flat fee contracts. All right. Some of the particulars. So, how did we make it happen? So, how long did it take? The platform was less than six months. Phase two and IBM built that out. They did a great job, worked together very closely. I should have put this in the bag, but I didn't, which is when I, because IBM, didn't have this background, right, of doing this. They didn't think that, you know, remember the, uh, the old uh, spaghetti sauce, Prego, it's in there, right? Prego, it's in there. Well, when it came to the platform, solar, it's not in there. So they launched, you know, the platform out, and it, they didn't really have a search. They said, we'll just use USA.gov for every single bureau. And somebody along the way didn't think to say, excuse me, right? I need something a little bit better than just USA.gov, which is not very good, right? I mean, it's okay, but it's not very good. But they did build it in less than six months. Uh, DOI.gov, we did that in about six months. We started it last January. We were done for the 4th of July, which was pretty cool. We're going to launch it. But then uh, the uh, Secretary of the Interior was worried about security and held the site for two months, right? Because they were they had just gotten in trouble with the OPM breach. Because OPM was running their data out of the Denver Data Center, and it was breached. So the Secretary of the Interior was like, you know what, I don't want anything out there. So let's just kind of hold it back a little bit, right? Bessie, we started earlier this year. It's supposed to launch at the end of June, Frank Vance launch. So we'll launch whatever it is and then sort of move it forward. The only thing about DOI, 15,000 distinct pieces of content. That was, a, that was an automated migration, all right? But this content management system they were in, we're an expert in. So we could easily suck that data out and push it in. It was, you know, we, we, did, we did that completely automated. The only problem with that is a little garbage in, garbage out, right? They didn't, they didn't edit all their content, so some of the stuff they had ended up getting moved over. Sort of an important thing to know. But the design was done ahead of time, so it's not a six-month project, right? I think they spent eight months doing this design, and that's a nice design, but any of you that actually know Drupal and have actually themed in Drupal and worked with Drupal know that theming this was not easy for my people, okay? And it's got all this collapsible menu thing. I mean, it's. And at the time, nobody was thinking of building them a headless site. Frankly, the platform's not headless, right? I mean, I could have done it easier if we did something. And it would have been easier if we just dropped the thing into Angular, did that as a customized hop, hop, and just did it as a headless site. And probably we should have. But anyway. So, theming this was actually a bit of a challenge. Um, the site is very deep. So, because it's very deep, you have a bit of a challenge with how we're doing, not only menuing, right? It's a lot of stuff. And then, but we have to have the obligatory picture of the secretary there. So we got the venues with the pictures and, you know, that. And I'll tell you another thing. Um, the, uh, we ended up adding this to the platform, but customizing taxonomy to drive breadcrumbs. They still have breadcrumbs in their site, and to actually have breadcrumbs and have proper URLs, right? We had to do that through taxonomy customization, which is probably the best way to do it anyway. But they go into their taxonomy, they actually place um, you know, what they want the URL to be for anybody that chooses that taxonomy value. And then when that person adds content with that taxonomy, they automatically get a URL and it's just taken care of for them. So different types of content can be in different parts of the site. Um, for anybody who's played with Drupal before and done any Drupal dev, you know that's actually a bit of a challenge with the platform, right? Because we don't create content on the back end. Right, it's all dynamic. Making those URLs actually work where you've got the same content type in two different places, it could be a challenge. And you don't want people hard coding their URLs, otherwise you can't go in and just make a global update, right? Seen that before, right? You get 7,000 pages in, they've all hard coded and go, I'd like to make a change. It's not gonna happen, all right? So DOI, again, this design took them a while to go through it, but they, had, they were not, we weren't contracted at that point, they were still building the platform. So it's a little bit of a, well, we did our part in six months, right? But they only gave us PSDs, so we really had to do the majority of the work. Give it Photoshop Bessie, Bessie will launch in June, but it won't have everything they need. And we'll talk about that in a second here. Um, 
There's over 19,000 distinct pieces of content, but the strategy was done by SRA, the government contractor, um, ahead of time. And they gave us 120 PowerPoint slides and said, here, here's your strategy. Thank you very much. We waited seven months for this, but that's all right. It's the truth. They were supposed to be done last July. They didn't hand it over to us until January of this year. And when they handed it over, Bessie still said, we want our site by June. I'm like, wait a minute. Because time and space continue. That's one, of, you know, that's one of the lessons learned. And then BLM's going to go live at the end of July, um, but we'll probably still add functionality. So we'll launch them, and then there's going to be some things missing. And then OIG, we did this in eight weeks, all right? Now, this is one, but you can tell why. Watch. So that's an eight-week website, right? But it was right off of Open Public or Open DOI. Um, and it was one of, you know, we walked in. They had a very limited budget. They only had 70 grand, 500 pieces of content. They have a customized uh, reporting system. And this part right here is the piece that, on the contracting side, when you're playing with the feds, make sure everything's included. This required solar, but because solar didn't make it in, there was this, I don't even think, as a matter of fact, I gotta go back and check, I don't think, this was a year ago, okay? And I'm pretty sure this still doesn't run off solar, and IBM hasn't added solar to the platform because of contract problems. So if you're playing this game, you're putting, you need to make sure that platform has all the little bits and pieces, or you have something in the contract to make sure you can add to it, all right? Probably would have been easier if they were sitting on something like Aquia, right? Number one, solar would have been there. Hey, it would have been a problem, um, but it would have been more expensive, all right? Anybody that's interested in that, we did actually try to pitch the platform ourselves with Aquia, um, and I can tell you what that cost was, and I'll tell you offline, all right? It was definitely more than $11,000 a month, though, all right? That's for sure. But anyway, so this part right here is the customized piece, but the rest of it's very, very straightforward. Actually, I was the tech lead on it, right? I dragged my team through it in an agile framework. We launched from start to finish um, in eight weeks. 700 hours estimated, 705, took 715, all right? So, but we built it, right? We got it running, so it was a good deal. So how do we do it? Things that actually worked well. We did agile framework mostly. See the. See the uh, air quotes, mostly, right? The government wants agile, there's more air quotes out here, but they don't always actually understand what that really means, all right? Still some aspects of waterfall, they always want you to build spec, I'm like, wait, it's agile, anyway, let's move forward. Short pops, we just said, hey, we're only gonna have six months, that's it, you get what you get, forces the time, time, timeline, contractually you have to get it done, we say, hey, we only have this much time, too bad you can't have it. Deal with it. The, the, uh, our friends at OIG said to me, I was in a meeting, they said, when are we gonna talk about making this look like whitehouse.gov? I said, when you triple your budget and your timeline, right? Then you have whitehouse.gov. Today, you can get this, right? So that forces the client and the team to be realistic. You might not think that actually works, but it does, right? But it puts a lot of pressure on everyone. Rapid prototyping, all the iterative development. Hey, every week we see something, right? Or every two weeks, here's something, here's what it looks like. Short wins, we show something, they're happy, and they're not complaining. Not like the old days where you wait till the end, you go, hey, look at this, it's great. And they go, no, it's not really great. And then the platform, we have a good starting point, all right? We have the platform. So again, what worked, the Agile framework, mostly fixed-speed <coughs> contracts, you got to do this. The platform is up all the time. It does not crash. The clients are pretty easy to work with, we're lucky, but, you know, that's a what worked. But the ability to calculate ROI. Previously, they were in the Denver Data Center. They have to employ staff to manage the center. Now they're paying 11 grand, that's it. They walk away. And one more thing that worked really well was this. Security, right? Good old OAPS Z attack proxy. They hammered the living daylights out of DOI. They found a, nothing in the red range. A bunch of orange, right? A bunch of yellow stuff that we just went in and we fixed. But not a single flaw on the security side. And it hasn't been hacked, right? So there we go. That would be bad. I might as well just shut up. You know, I'll just go ahead and close the front of the business and kind of move on if, this, if it got hacked. The pain points. There's no drush from the platform. If you're a developer, you know these pain points. It's not automated. It's not like Aquila where I can drag and drop from dev to staging to prod, and that is a problem, right? It's because IBM stood it up, this platform. And there's rudimentary reporting. It's not sitting out there where you got 5,000 clients like, you know, one of these other guys where you just drop things in. Scoping cost, they, again, uh, I want whitehouse.gov for 70K. I'm sorry, right? We had, we had just enough time to get you up and running, get your stuff moved, make it work, make the changes that you want, right? So we do run into a lot of that. They would just say, I want everything and you can't have it. There's a little bit of a problem. This is the biggest part. 
and I, can, this, I, I should have just done 30 minutes on content preparation, right? Um, PDFs have to be 508 compliant for the feds. It's a requirement, okay? It's a lot of work, time, and money. DOIs are not, so they're in trouble, but they don't have the budget. They went to get the budget, they didn't get the budget, so they said, hey, we don't have the budget for it, so you can't sue us, right? No problems. But unfortunately, Bessie, we have a migration contract that's more than the actual development of the site. Okay, there are 11,000 PDFs that my team is working on, 15 people right now going in and fixing PDFs and tagging content for migration. Unfortunately, we'll still do automated migrate, but it's got to be tagged, and PDFs have to be fixed by hand. I'm not talking about migrating it in. Everybody forgets this, it's a big deal, right? The Bureau of Indian Affairs right now has 12,000 pieces of content and 9,000 PDFs, and they think they're gonna fix all their PDFs and make them five-way compliant by themselves. 8,000 of them are not compliant. It's at least 30 minutes of PDF, right? That is really important, especially if you're dealing with a federal client. I can't overstress it. All right, usually I'm right on time, um, and I'm right at 30. Any quick questions uh, about what we just talked about? Anybody have anything? It's a very basic showcase, right? We're just talking business. But yeah, well, uh, so who owns the platform now that's going to be shopped around outside the DOI? Okay, question. Who owns the platform that's going to be shopped around outside DOI? DOI owns the platform. So it technically wouldn't be shopped around, but other agencies can come to them and say, can I host with you guys? And they'll let them, they'll actually let them host. FJC did, Federal Judicial Center. They'll let them host with them, and they'll just charge them. So it's like they've stood up their own government aqua, as it were. So um, I've been using IBM software, and I do everything myself. How do I get IBM to like set up the platform for all of you guys? Pay them eleven thousand dollars a month. I'm serious. That is the only way you have to pay them. All right. In DOI's case, they wanted that business, so they said we'll do it. They bought it. Eleven grand is. They bought the business. And that's fine. You buy lots of things, right? I buy crappy shirts and shoes. <laughs> they bought the business. So the only way to get them to do that 